friends, I'd like to uh, welcome you all here this morning. And I'd like to uh, begin the morning with a brief passage from St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. Paul writes, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how could they call on him without having faith in him? And how could they have faith without having heard of him? And how could they hear without someone to spread the news? On behalf of Wycliffe College, we are delighted to welcome you all here this day, which is devoted to the sacred craft of preaching. And we're particularly privileged to have as our featured speaker, the Reverend Dr. Fleming Rutledge, who will be introduced uh, in a moment. Yesterday, uh, my wife Fauna and I joined Fleming in becoming Baptists uh, because we went to York Minster uh, Baptist Church and we heard a very fine sermon by uh, Dr. Peter Holmes. I saw Peter sort of around here a bit earlier and uh, we're very glad to own him as a, a Wycliffe College graduate. But it does remind me that there may be others here from outside the Anglican fold. So I thought I might just ask for a little show of hands, who here is not an Anglican? Look at that. Wow. That's almost half of us. I want to say welcome to Wycliffe College. Well, of course, one of the things that brings us together is the esteem that we hold for faithfully proclaiming the Word of God in a way that is invigorating and challenging and transforming. But, of course, preaching has a bad reputation in many places. And it, I think it's been this way throughout uh, history. Uh, one of my favorite uh, examples comes uh, from George Eliot's Middlemarch. And uh, there's a, a woman in that a novel by the name of Mrs. Cadwallader. And she's counseling the young bride of a clergyman. And she says, Oh, my dear, when you have a clergyman in your family, you must accommodate your tastes. I did that very early. When I married Humphrey... I made up my mind to like sermons, and I set out by liking the end very much. <laughs> that soon spread to the middle and the beginning, because I couldn't have the end without them. This is uh, not an uncommon, I think, reaction that uh, many perhaps have in many of our churches. But, of course, the task of preaching is much more exalted and sacred than that. In fact, I'm drawn to one image that uh, comes from Hayden Robinson. And he says this. During the French Revolution, political prisoners were herded into dungeons. In one place, a prisoner possessed a Bible. His cell was crammed with men who wanted to hear the word of God. Each day, for only a few moments, a small shaft of light would come through a tiny window near the ceiling. The prisoners devised a plan whereby they would lift the owner of the Bible onto their shoulders and into the sunlight. There, in that position, he would study the scriptures. Then they would bring him down and say, Tell us now, friend, what did you read while you were in the light? Robinson comments, that remains the sacred, sweaty task of the preacher to take advantage of the time his people give him to share with them what he has learned in the light. My prayer today is that we might all understand that sacred task a bit better and, be, and emerge more devoted to it. As we prepare to uh, enter into this day, I invite you to bow your head in prayer and uh, we'll pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to pass the proceedings now over to uh, the Reverend Dr. Peter Robinson, uh, professor here uh, in our pastoral department, and uh, one of his main responsibilities is preaching. So, Peter. Thank you, Stephen. It's good to see you all. 
as Stephen mentioned, we're representing quite a breadth today. I spoke to uh, Steve Huco, who is handling the overall uh, um, publicity as well as uh, the um, preparation for the day. And uh, Steve said there's actually 20 denominations represented here, which is a wonderful thing. And I also know that people have come a long way. I don't know all the places people have come from, but uh, I believe that there's some were coming from the Dominican Republic. Some, someone came from London, England. Um, people are here from uh, Nashville, from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. So people have come a long way for today. It's wonderful to have you here. One of the great things that we want at Wycliffe College is um, not only to be teaching and preparing people for ministry, but also to be working alongside of people who are already in ministry and supporting them and encouraging them. And that's uh, one of the main things we want to do with Preaching Day, uh, which as a preacher myself, I know that we need encouragement. We need uh, opportunities to come together to talk about preaching, to share about preaching, and to learn about preaching. So it's a great privilege to do that together, and particularly, of course, to have Fleming with us today. I hope you all got the uh, little booklet with all the information for the day. Inside you will find a schedule for the day, which we will be following um, for the most part. And then also I want to just mention briefly that there's also a little flyer there for Crux Books, uh, which if you don't know, Crux Books is just downstairs, almost immediately underneath us, just a little bit back that way. And there's a little enter to win thing here. So if you go down there, you can enter to win um, from uh, Crux Books to win a door prize. But one of the reasons I want to mention Crux, of course, is because it is one of the places that you can go to buy a copy of Fleming's latest book. And uh, I hope that many of you have had a chance to read it. Fleming uh, has told me that it is actually now, to, now out in paperback, so you can buy a lot less expensive copy of it than the hardback. Um, but this book, uh, some of you will know, and maybe it's the reason some of you came, was uh, voted in December as the 2017 Christianity Today Book of the Year. So we're really pleased uh, that you've been recognized in that way, Fleming. Fleming is a great friend of Wycliffe College. Uh, she taught preaching here uh, eight or nine years ago, was it? Yes. Yep. And, uh, and has continued to visit Wycliffe and to be engaged with Wycliffe. And I know that uh, many of you are friends of Fleming's, and so it's a real privilege to have her back with us. I want to read just a little section from the book, which I hope begins to frame a little bit of the day for us, as uh, Fleming leads us to focus on the cross. Uh, the title of the book is The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read a little section from the chapter on the primacy of the cross. The cross as the center of Christian understanding. The place of the cross in Christian theology has been at issue from the very first days of the new faith. We know this because the Corinthian and Galatian letters of the Apostle Paul were written within 20 or 25 years of the resurrection. And those letters stake out the unique meaning of the Lord's death. I can't read it with Fleming's great accent, but I'll do the best I can. Paul had his work cut out for him. For as Jürgen Moltmann writes in the very first sentence of the crucified God, the cross is not and cannot be loved. As a general rule, the theologa, Theologia Gloria, the theology of glory, will drive out the theologa, Theologia Crucis, the theology of the cross, every time in a comfortable society. And those of us who are preachers know that far too well. We will often observe that this is particularly true in America and Canada, where optimism and positive thinking reign side by side. Teaching about the cross is very hard work. We see something of this in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, to Christians in Corinth, where Paul drains himself of every mental and emotional resource in hopes that their trust in the gospel will be renewed. Taking up the cross, as Jesus himself called us to do, means a total reorientation of the self toward the way of Christ. Anybody who has preached for any time will know that that is one of the biggest issues that we have in preaching faithfully. And so today we're going to have Fleming come and share with us some of her own experience, uh, 22 years in pastoral ministry, and then also her ministry 
preaching and teaching about preaching on an international basis. Uh, one of the things that we do at Wycliffe College is that we require anybody in the MDiv program to listen to at least one of Fleming's sermons before they graduate, so they get a little taste of, of Fleming's preaching. So, Fleming, if you'd like to stand up, let me pray for you. And uh, Stephen's already prayed for the day, but let me pray for you. Yeah. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much for Fleming. And we thank you for the gift and power of your Holy Spirit in her life. And we pray and ask that you will now bless her as she shares with us from the many things she has learned and the many things she has struggled with in her faith and in her ministry. I pray now that you will sustain her and strengthen her and that your spirit will speak through her to guide us and to give us wisdom as we seek to be faithful in our roles in your church. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That was very strengthening. I really needed that, and I thank you very much. Um, I love Wycliffe. I love being here. I love looking out at this wonderful assembly of fellow clergy, fellow preachers, fellow students, because we're all students, God willing, to the end of our lives. And it's a great honor to be here. I particularly like speaking with a group like this. I hope we're going to have a lot of time for questions and answers and discussion. Um, this thing's wobbling. <laughs> well, um, but I don't really know how it's going to go because um, although I've spent weeks and weeks preparing this, this is the first time that I have really presented the book in this kind of setting. I've been talking about the contents of this book all of my adult life, but trying to tell you some of what's important to me in the book that I've written over 20 years is somewhat challenging because I don't want to just say to you what's already in the book because you can read it. <laughs> but I hope that this series of presentations will give you a kind of orientation to what I believe the New Testament is doing with what it has inherited from the Old Testament in light of this unique, unrepeatable event of the crucifixion of the Son of God. So there may be some stumbles along the way because I don't know how well this is organized, although I've been working on it for a long time. This is, in a sense, a kind of almost trial run, and you can help me with that. I'm not going to promise you that we will have questions and answers after the first presentation because I don't know how long it's going to take, but I can promise you that we will have some time of that nature. And I do want to encourage those of you who can stay. I know that everyone has busy and has schedules, but for those who can stay, tonight will be the most important presentation, from my point of view anyway. Now, um, I want to <clears throat> take up Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians that he is with them with fear and trembling, which I am enormously encouraged by because I'm always in fear and trembling whenever I uh, speak or preach particularly. But I do want to tell you about two pretty significant disabilities I have because it sometimes becomes pretty apparent. I don't want to have to apologize for it later. I'm going to apologize for it now. I have severe hearing loss. And if I look at you with incomprehension, it's because I don't hear you. Unfortunately, I didn't hear a single thing that Stephen said and very little of what Peter said because I was sitting behind them. My hearing aids are brand new, top of the line, Sometimes they work, sometimes they're worse than nothing. So, <laughs> in fact, the first time I ever realized how my, that I was getting deaf was here, when I couldn't hear the students' questions. The second disability, people always laugh when I say this, but it's not funny. I have terminal absent-mindedness. And during the day today, I will almost certainly lose my glasses, possibly my hearing aids, probably my notes, very likely that black pocketbook. So those of you who are so minded might be able to help me by saying, hey, you forgot your glasses. I need a lot of help. <laughs> 
high maintenance is the word. I don't need to pray again because we just had a wonderful prayer. Now let me divide this up into the first and the second part so I won't, here we go. Now you, you should have access to a single sheet synopsis. This is supposed to be three pages long, but I have had really serious problems with my computer since I've been here and I was not able to finish this. But I think the first page will help you. You don't need to look at it now, but it's, it will help you remember some of what, uh, it's a little overview of what I'm gonna say this morning. Now the overall biblical text for this four part presentation is 1 Corinthians chapter one, through chapter 2, verse 5. This text will be at the heart and the center of everything that I do here today and tonight. I'm trying to get this so it won't wobble because I'm leaning on it. The Apostle Paul writes, Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel and not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will thwart. Where are the wise men? Where are the lawyers, the specialists? Where are the debaters, the experts of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human beings, and the weakness of God is stronger than human beings. For consider your call, brothers and sisters, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast of the Lord. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in much fear and trembling. 
and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of humanity, but in the power of God. May the Holy Spirit engraft these words in our hearts for our great good and, O oh Lord, for your great glory. Amen. Four Sundays ago, the lectionary featured that text along with the famous Micah passage, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God, and the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. I wondered, as I sat listening, what the preacher would do. What he did was, from my point at least, entirely predictable in today's church. He preached about the Beatitudes. He mentioned Micah very briefly, and he completely ignored the passage that I just read. A better way, it seems to me, would have been to link the Beatitudes to a robust sermon about Jesus Christ and him crucified. As it is now in the Episcopal Church in the States, at any rate, preachers almost always choose the gospel most often from one of the synoptics. Now, for those of you who are not users of the Reform Common Lectionary, this may not be quite as telling, but my experience is that very few preachers today are choosing to preach from Paul's epistles, and certainly not choosing to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. That doesn't say anything about any of you because I don't know what you are preaching. This is the sermons that I'm hearing as I go all around the states. As it is now, to repeat, the Gospels are chosen, and usually the synoptics, because John does not really get his due. He doesn't have a year to himself. The psalm is almost never preached. The Old Testament reading and the epistle might be given a glancing notice, but rarely chosen for serious consideration. What we're left then is mostly the teachings of Jesus and some stories about what Jesus did. All these sermons that I listened to these last few weeks since Christmas, every one of them has expounded the Sermon on the Mount in almost complete detachment from the Christology of Matthew. I'm speaking now to those in the circles where the lectionary rules the roost. And until Sunday, which is Transfiguration, and I heard a very Christ-centered sermon from Peter Holmes, which praise God. But um, until then, all these sermons on the Sermon on the Mount were preached without any reference to what is a very high Christology in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, what has happened to bring this about? I've struggled with what to emphasize on this very concentrated day of preaching the cross of Christ. I've considered spending some time trying to explain what I think has happened in the churches to diminish preaching, and particularly the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified. I think I know how that happened, but it would take too long and would take us too far off the main track. Instead, I will try to concentrate more on the word of the cross itself. For the purposes of today's presentations, I'm going to use a sort of shorthand, which I have on your sheet. I'm going to call this focus on Jesus' words and deeds in the synoptic gospels. I'm going to call that the Jesus kerygma. Now, you know what kerygma is. In the Greek of Jesus' time, kerygma meant proclamation or announcement. And, of course, in the New Testament, 
More specifically, it means the apostolic preaching of the cross. Remember that Paul was essentially a preacher, not a writer. Paul was a preacher. He went all over the Mediterranean world preaching. What we have in his letters is some idea of what he actually preached. It's important to remember that, I think. So when he talks about the word of the cross, he's talking about his own preaching of the cross. So we need to imagine ourselves, as Lewis Martin used to say, taking a seat in the Corinthian congregation as Paul begins to preach. Now, people in the churches do talk about the gospel all the time, but not with the same meaning, because the Jesus charisma is not the same thing as what I'm going to call the Christ charisma. The Christ charisma includes the Jesus charisma, but the Jesus charisma does not necessarily include the Christ charisma. You can tell stories all day long about what Jesus said and what Jesus did without ever saying anything about who he was. That's why the epistles are so important. For the most part, the epistles are pure Christ charisma. Without the Christ charisma, we would be in danger of telling stories about him all year round without ever identifying him as Messiah and Lord the second person of the Trinity, the one who will come to be our judge. The continual preaching of the Jesus charisma, I believe, has led the church away from the gospel and into a sort of great and good man religion. The repeated telling of the same stories over and over throughout the three-year cycle without any significant Christology leads to a severe diminishment of the preaching of Jesus' unique significance and his living power. The so-called Jesus Seminar, the group of scholars who met recently, I mean met regularly, excuse me, I don't know whether they're still meeting or not, the group of scholars who met regularly to determine what Jesus really said and what, in their view, was fabrication, hasn't been as much in the news as it was a decade ago, but it doesn't need to be because it has accomplished its work. It has accomplished its work of shrinking our Lord until he has no more authority among us than the Dalai Lama and perhaps less. I used to ignore this, thinking it would all go away. But on the contrary, efforts like this have had a truly devastating effect on preaching and teaching about Jesus in the mainline churches in the United States. Now, I, don't, I can, really can't speak for you, but I'm describing what I see overall. And some of the communications I get from um, the Canadian churches beyond Wycliffe would bear this out. What we hear... What I hear all the time now, and I go to so many churches, what I hear all the time is the Jesus charisma. And even that has been drastically altered since the miraculous and numinous New Testament events like the walking on water. They have been reduced and domesticated. We do not really hear the note of transformative wonder who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, it's not difficult to preach the Jesus charisma. Or let's say not as difficult. Jesus as a man, a religious figure, is clearly a person with great moral and spiritual authority. So it's not particularly courageous or extraordinary to tell stories about a person with great moral and spiritual authority. It's not difficult to ask people to pay attention to his sayings and doings. What's much more challenging 
is weaving the sayings and doings into a Christ kerygma that calls people into a crisis of decision. I believe that all preaching should call the hearers into a crisis of decision revolving around the question, who is this man? As Jesus himself puts it, who do you say that I am? Without this question, preaching loses its urgency. This question directly put to the hearer, who do you say that Jesus is? Or rather, speaking as himself, who do you say that I am? It's amazing how often I have heard sermons on that very passage that drift away into a discussion of the lovability of St. Peter. In fact, sometimes it seems to me that Peter is the preacher's favorite subject. Instead of talking about, now this did not happen yesterday, I was listening, Peter Holmes did not do this yesterday. But most of the sermons I've heard about the Transfiguration, Peter talks, the preacher, excuse me, the preacher talks about Peter. Instead of talking about the miraculous draft of fish, the preacher talks about Peter. Instead of talking about what is happening in the life of God as Jesus is led away to torture, the preacher talks about Peter. Now you see there are no stories about Peter in the epistles, although he does get one unflattering mention in Galatians. <laughs> the epistles, including the epistles of Peter, focus on the Christ kerygma. Without the epistles, we would not have a template for understanding the intentions of the synoptic evangelists. I say synoptic, synoptics because it's not so easy to overlook the high Christology of John, the least favorite of all the Gospels among the Jesus Seminar participants. Maybe that's why I hear so few sermons on John's Gospel. And of course John does not have his own year in the lectionary, so that presents another kind of problem. I have a friend who spent the whole year, he's a rector of a church in Massachusetts, a very unusual rector of a church in Massachusetts because he actually teaches Bible, teaches the Bible to his parishioners during the week. Um, he taught the Gospel of John for a whole year. And when the class was finished, they agreed that they would come together and that they would read the whole Gospel straight through, just read it out loud, taking turns, one person per chapter. And he said that when this had been done and had been finished, everyone simply sat in stunned silence because an event of the word had taken place among them. So let's return to the text from Corinthians. I got off the subject a little bit there. If the epistles are the apostolic preaching of the Christ kerygma. Let me say that again. If the epistles are the apostolic preaching of the Christ kerygma, which is a little different from the Gospels. They're preaching the Christ kerygma too, but in a different way. Then the epistles are a sort of commentary on the stories of Jesus that circulated orally throughout the church until they were written down by the evangelists. The epistles tell us what these pericopes signify, theologically and Christologically. So let's ask ourselves the all-important question. Why does every one of the four Gospels culminate in a very long narrative of the suffering, the trial, the scourging, and the crucifixion of Jesus? And why do each of them, 
have three passion predictions carefully spaced through the events of the ministry. We need the epistles to tell us this, especially Paul, Peter, and Hebrews. The epistles, you see, are hands-on examples of the way that the very earliest Christians interpreted the Christ event because they didn't have the Gospels in written form. And so without the epistles, we can't understand the fullness of what the four passion narratives are describing. Now, don't get me wrong about this, because all four evangelists have constructed their passions, their passion narratives, with a central goal in mind, a message about the mission and, above all, the identity of the man who was crucified. But without the epistles, we would not fully understand this message from the Synoptic Gospels, not by a long shot. We have been through, in the church and in the academy, we've been through a very long period of deconstructing the Gospels, which has left us bereft, to some extent, of what the evangelists wanted us to know. I suppose I'm stating these things in rather extreme fashion, but you have to, well, I'd like you to understand that I am of an age to have been brought up in my early adulthood with the historical critical method. And that was the way that one interpreted the scripture and that was what one preached. Now that began to change when I was in seminary. I was at Union Theological Seminary in New York City in the 1970s. And before my very eyes, this transformation was taking place. The historical method, historical critical method was beginning to lose its premier place. And a canonical form of understanding the scripture was on the, on the rise. And I was so privileged to be there to see that happening, particularly in the work of someone like Raymond Brown, who became not only a mentor, but also a friend. And he told me, and he told it, he said it publicly, that he began, during that period, he began to doubt the tools of his trade. Isn't that amazing? Raymond Brown, proudest product of the Albright School. He began to doubt the truth the tools of his trade because he could see that picking the Bible apart and not seeing it as a whole was not serving the church. That's not in my notes. I just, um, such an important time. Uh, and and I, I, I want to do anything I can to encourage you to say thank you, historical critical method, but you have given me everything you can give me. And now we are understanding the scripture the way the fathers of the church understood it, the way the reformers understood it, and the way that many churches throughout our own time, especially the black church, have understood it as a whole. Now, for instance, take the stories about Jesus' table fellowship. This is what has happened theologically in the mainline churches. I can only speak with real authority about the mainline churches. You know what I mean by that. In America, that means the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, the Congregationalists, and the Methodists, and maybe some of the Reformed churches. In most of the mainline churches in the States, the stories about Jesus' table fellowship has become the center of the kerygma. Jesus ate with sinners and welcomed outcasts. That's the sum and substance of the gospel in many circles today. This isn't a scientific poll, but I don't think it's too strong a statement. I've been hearing at least 60 sermons a year in person, plus reading many others. I peruse Jesus diocesan newspapers and magazines. I listen to the clergy talk. The references to Jesus' table fellowship outnumber references to the crucifixion 
by a really significant amount. And this isn't only true in the main lines. I used to think that the evangelical churches, a lot of them anyway, didn't preach about the cross because they didn't observe Good Friday, but now I realize that there are other reasons. I used to see a good deal of a really famous charismatic preacher at an Episcopal church in Darien, Connecticut. You would know his name, some of you. Um, there was even a book, Miracle in Darien. People came over in buses to hear him. Once, in a small group of clergy, I heard him confide that he simply did not know what to say on Good Friday. He would ask somebody else to preach. He was a Corinthian. He knew only the signs and the wonders. It's not accidental that Paul's impassioned passage about preaching the cross was written to the church in Corinth. The church there had convinced themselves that they were already living in the resurrection. They did not want to hear about Jesus Christ and him crucified. To them, Paul wrote in the passage that I began with that his whole purpose in life was to preach the cross. His reasoning is built up on a structure of contrasts. In our passage, he sets up two things, once against the other. One is foolishness or folly. What's the opposite of foolishness? Wisdom. Now, this is important. So he's contrasting foolishness and wisdom, right? Ah, oh, but that's not what he's doing at all. He's not contrasting foolishness and wisdom. For him, the opposite of wisdom. Well, let's hear what he says. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the wisdom of God. That's what the sentence would require. You contrast foolishness and wisdom. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe it, but to those who do believe, it's wisdom, wisdom of God. No, that's not what he says. You know what he says. The word of the cross is the power of God not the wisdom of God, the power of God. The Corinthians were into wisdom. Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, as in Gnosticism. The word of the cross, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. The word power occurs five times in the passage that I read. The opposite of wisdom the opposite of foolishness is power. And here's another sentence from later. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. But not just any power. We know that power in the worldly sense is a two-faced thing. It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. The power that Paul is talking about is not earthly power at all, but the power of God. He goes on. For the Jews, and he doesn't say the Jews, that was stupid. <laughs> Take that back. For Jews demand signs and wonders. And Greeks, Gentiles, seek wisdom, gnosis. But we preach Christ crucified. Notice how he sets the preaching of the cross over against everything else. Because Jews and Gentiles includes everybody. This is interesting when applied to today's circumstances. We have all kinds of seekers today, just as in Paul's time. Some seek religious experience while others, the secular and the skeptical among us, seek rational evidence, demonstrations, proofs. Two different mindsets, all of it way off the track, none of it centered on the cross. Because the cross of Christ is, after all, a stumbling block to the Jews, to religious people, and foolishness to Gentiles, 
secular people. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, both religious people and secular people, the cross is Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The way Paul plays these words, power, wisdom, and foolishness is key to the passage. So what we have here is a strongly theological message, that is to say, centered on theos, God, and specifically on the power of God working through the crucifixion of Jesus. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of God is, a, is opposite to what the world knows as power and wisdom. Now, when Paul says that the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than man, excuse the politically incorrect term, I just, stronger than human beings, okay. The foolishness of God is wiser than human beings and the weakness of God is stronger than human beings. Now, this is about, you know, I've introduced that unfortunate sub subject of political correctness, I take it back. I'm not a supporter of what's going on in the United States right now. <laughs> Let's scratch that. Let's just say that this is about preaching. This whole passage and this whole thing I'm trying to do is about preaching the cross, the Christ, excuse me, the Christ kerygma, the Christ kerygma, not the Jesus kerygma. There have always been ways of preaching the cross that essentially ask us just to look at Jesus on the cross and be deeply moved by the sight. I'd like to say that again because it's very prominent in today's church. We are asked to see, so to speak, see in the mind's eye, Jesus on the cross and be moved by it a kind of um, Abelardian point of view, Peter Abelard, who taught that the crucifixion moved us emotionally and moved us to imitate it. I believe that that is not by a long shot the way that Paul is preaching the word of the cross. When Paul says that the cross is the power of God. He does not mean that we have powerful feelings above it. He means that something is actually happening. God is doing something when Jesus is crucified. God is doing something. I'm going to give you another rather extreme example of trivializing the word of the cross, as Paul calls it. The word of the cross is a rather odd expression when you think about it. When Paul says the word of the cross, he essentially means the preaching of the cross, the kerygma of the cross. A person whom I regard as reliable told me a few months ago that she heard a member of the clergy say, the cross was something bad that happened to Jesus on the way to the resurrection. Now that may not be exactly what her words were, but my informer, the person who told me about this, was upset by what she took to be a dismissive tone about the crucifixion. Good Friday is just something we have to get behind us in order to get to Easter. Nothing of real significance is happening on the cross. God is not actually doing anything there. Jesus is being victimized, certainly. But whatever it was that happened on Sunday morning puts the crucifixion into true perspective. Well, if that's the case, then why did all four of the evangelists put so much intentional emphasis on the passion narrative? 
Why is it so long and so carefully structured? And why was it accompanied by signs of earth-shattering importance? Matthew says, the earth was opened. The rocks were split. The dead were raised. And the veil of the temple was rent in two. Matthew wants us to know that the divine hand was doing this. God is doing something. That's what Paul means when he says, we apostles preach Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The word of the cross is the power of God. The word of the cross is the power of God. But note this. God is not doing something with or to Jesus. This is very important. God is not doing something with or to Jesus. He is doing it in Jesus because Jesus is God, the Word made flesh. He is the one who was in the beginning with God and who was God. That is the Christ kerygma. When that is joined to the cross, you have preaching that is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know, this is called Preaching Day. I presume you're here because you're interested in preaching. Even if you're not a preacher yourself, you have an investment in preaching. Every Christian, every Christian should have an investment in preaching. Because when the true kerygma is preached, and especially the word of the cross, it is the power of God. Will Willimon is a good friend of mine. He was here for preaching day last year. We quote each other a lot. In fact, he tells stories about me and they're not true. <laughs> Will has often said and has often written, Christian preaching begins and ends with three words. Christian preaching is impossible without three words. You had best not get in the pulpit ever again without these three words. I wonder if you can imagine what those three words are. And God said. Genesis 1. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The word of God which creates what it calls forth, which creates out of nothing, which calls into being the things that do not exist in order to put an end to the things that are, like human power, human presumption, human wisdom. The preaching of the cross is the power and wisdom of God and God said. When the preacher gets into the pulpit, every word that he or she utters should be designed to serve the ultimate purpose of allowing God to speak. The preacher gets out of the way and allows God to speak. In fact, sometimes God will simply take over even if the preacher doesn't get out of the way. <laughs> but I wouldn't, wouldn't bet on it. And I'm not saying I'm successful in doing this, but it has always been my goal that God should speak through his own word. I love a story I read, read once about the great orchestra conductor. Um, Toscanini, yes. He was famous for his terrifying manner with his musicians. One day they were rehearsing a Beethoven symphony 
he angrily stopped them in the middle of a phrase. Gentlemen, they were all men in those days. Gentlemen, you are nothing. Well, they were used to hearing that. Gentlemen, I am nothing. That was a surprise. You are nothing. I am nothing. Beethoven. Beethoven is everything. As preachers, we are empty vessels. You are nothing. I am nothing. But it has pleased God to call us empty vessels, to speak his word, and to pour his spirit into us. And the word of the spirit is the power of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is everything. Time for a break. When we come back, I'll take some questions. Very short break. <laughs>
start. I'm going to get started now, if you would take a seat. My sister told me a long time ago, never talk for two hours without giving people a break. So that's what I did. Um, I made a mistake, though. I make so many mistakes. I, um, I thought I had finished for the morning. That was not... So, I've got another whole presentation here. So I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to renege on my promise to give you questions this morning. I promise that there will be time. Maybe we'll have time, it depends on how long this takes. As I said, this is the first time I've ever put all this together and it really needs some work, but um, you're my first audience, so to speak, since I wrote, the, since the book was published. Um, now this second portion, the first one, first portion was called the Jesus Kerygma and the Christ Kerygma. This portion is called the Descent into Hell and Christus Victor um, because I have essentially tried to divide the content of my book or not divided, it's not divided, but to arrange it so that it will illuminate the two aspects of what's going on in the cross. And I think that's on your sheet of paper. And I'll get to it in a few moments. Now, we're gonna start. I've been working on, I worked, I worked on the book, The Crucifixion, for 20 years and more. And during that time, people would ask me the worst thing you can ask a writer, which is, when are you going to finish that book? It always sounds somewhat like an accusation. But there was an even more disturbing question, and this is why I bring it up. Sometimes I would get this question. When are you going to finish that book on the atonement? Well, I had my standard answer ready. It's not about the atonement. It's about the crucifixion, and it's about everything the Bible says about the crucifixion. I got a lot of satisfaction out of saying that, but I don't think a certain slice of the mainline churches have been convinced. <laughs> the atonement, so-called, has been out of favor in the mainline churches for a long time. The people who phrased the question that way, not always, but almost always, we're asking it with a bit of a sharp edge. Why are you taking so long to write a book about such an outmoded, discredited subject, atonement? Well, we have to talk first about something that's just as unpopular as talking about atonement, and that's talking about sin. Sin and atonement go together. To judge from my experience of listening to sermons, again, nobody wants to talk about either one of those things. If you never hear any sermons about sin, then you don't need to hear a sermon about atonement. And a third ultra-forbidden -for topic is, of course, judgment. Being judgmental is the worst thing you can say about anybody today. It's interesting to note that judgmental is a very new word. The first appearance of the English word judgmental with the negative connotations of today was, believe it or not, in 1965. That says a lot about the cultural changes that have profoundly affected the church's theology. Judgmentalism is now considered by many people to be worse than sin itself. Now, something else, though, has taken the place of the topic of sin. 
and we are allowed to be judgmental about that, namely the topic of evil. In fact, in the States at least, discussion about evil is front and center in our political atmosphere and has been at least since the now, the now rather benign figure of Ronald Reagan started talking about an access, an, excuse me, an axis of evil. I've been reflecting upon why it seems to be acceptable to talk about evil, but unacceptable to be able to talk about sin. It seems to me that we're typically able to project evil outward onto another person, another group, another religion, another country, whereas sin in the Christian worldview is typically a subject for the individual to recognize in herself or in himself or in the church. In the church, the confession of sin and the plea for forgiveness can be general or it can be individual, but either way, we are expected in the Christian faith to repent of it sin on behalf of our own group and to seek to overcome it in our own selves. Now how this understanding of sin came to be so suspect is a long story which I won't go into today, but in recent decades there has been so much resistance to a liturgical confession of sin every Sunday that increasingly many churches simply omit it. I don't think very many people in our pews recognize how insistent the New Testament is that Jesus Christ died for sin or to take away sin. There are between 30 and 40 explicit statements to that effect in the various books of the New Testament. It is indeed one of the most fundamental attestations in the New Testament taken as a whole. And yet there has always been disagreement about what that means. What does it mean that Jesus died for sin or to take away sin? And so in recent decades, the affirmation has simply been cast aside in favor of saying that Jesus' death shows us how much God loves us or that it moves our hearts to love Jesus. Sin apparently has nothing to do with it. I realize that I can be accused of unfair characterization here, and I'm sure that there are many of you here today who can protest that this does not describe you. But I've been paying close attention to this matter since I was very young, and as an overall diagnosis of a serious problem, I think I'm on the right track. I'm leading up to something very important. The biblical testimony about the nature of sin can be essentially set forth in two coexisting, not competing, two coexistent categories, and I think this is on your sheet. I got these two categories from two different scholars. Paul Ricoeur, great French reform thinker, and Chris Becker, J. Christian Becker, a prodigiously gifted, if eccentric, professor of New Testament at Princeton. Each of these important thinkers identifies the same two themes con concerning the nature of sin. I believe that these themes are central to the preaching of the church. I hope you'll pay close attention to this. Sin, biblically understood, has a twofold aspect. One, sin is a responsible guilt for which atonement must be made. Two, sin is an alien power which must be driven from the field. Now to elaborate for a minute, number one, sin is a responsible guilt for which atonement must be made. It follows that the crucifixion is understood as a sacrifice for sin in this sense. 
Second, sin is an alien power which must be driven from the field. All human beings are enslaved by this power, as Paul explicitly says in Romans and as John explicitly says in his gospel. Because we are enslaved by this alien power, we must be liberated by a greater power. The crucifixion is therefore understood to be Christ's victory over the powers of sin and death, and this is commonly called the theme of Christus Victor. Another way to say the same thing about these two categories, this is much shorter and much easier, is to quote from the hymn, Rock of Ages. The hymn contains this plea to God in Christ. Be of sin the double cure. Save me from its guilt and power. There in a nutshell, we have the significance of the cross. It saves us from the guilt of sin and the power of sin. These two components are of equal gravity. Sin is both a guilt and a power. Recur sums up the two aspects of sin this way. First, subjective weight, which is borne by individuals and groups. That's the responsible guilt, the subjective weight. And second, the alien power, Recur calls objective maleficence. Subjective weight and objective malevolence. This objective malevolence, this alien power, is separate from and opposed to God's purposes in the case of both individuals and groups. Satan is capable of capturing entire corporate entities called, in princi called principalities and powers in the New Testament and causing them to serve his, the enemy's, ends. In the first instance, responsible guilt, yours and mine, subjective um, weight. That's weight as in heavy weight. In the first instance, responsible guilt or subjective weight, yours and mine, the guilt of the church as well as the state Crucifixion is understood to be a sacrifice for sin, directly from the Old Testament. In the second instance, that of alien power, the crucifixion is understood as Christ's victory over the power of sin and its partner, death. We'll take up the motifs of sacrifice and atonement this afternoon, but in this present section, of my presentation, we're going to focus on the second theme, the objective malevolence which assaulted Jesus on the cross and his victory over it, Christus Victor. I represent a strong and growing subset of biblical interpretation called apocalyptic theology. If you want to know more about it, ask Joe Mangino. This subset of biblical interpreters, these apocalyptic theologians, impertinently claim to have recovered the essential New Testament cosmology, out of which the Christus Victor theme emerges. This is more important than I know how to tell you, because between the enlightenment of the, 18th and 19th, of the 17th and 18th centuries and our own time, the alien power disappeared from scholarship, from preaching, from teaching, from prayer and personal piety. Since the Second World War, however, it has reappeared, precisely because people began groping for categories in which to speak about the deliberate murder of millions. To give just one example, I've never forgotten how during the Rwandan genocide of 1994, Time Magazine, which always had pictures of people for generations, pictures of people on the front of Time magazine. I think this is the first time they didn't put a person on the cover. Instead, they put a statement 
by a missionary serving in that country during those unspeakable months. And this was the quote. There are no devils left in hell. They are all in Rwanda. The 20th century became known, of course, as the age of genocide. And there is no reason to think that the 21st is going to be any better. And so many have groped for a new way of talking about the demonic dimension that the New Testament takes for granted. In spite of this rethinking, however, the concept of objective malevolence is the great missing link in almost all biblical interpretation of the cross in our time. Almost all, but not quite all, as I may or may not get around to explaining. Even the most heartfelt and well-meaning sermons and teaching of scripture over centuries have almost entirely overlooked the alien presence that is always there in the New Testament. Most sermons and teachings based in scripture neglect to tell us that there is this looming objective maleficence in every page of the New Testament. One of the reasons I wrote my book about the Lord of the Rings, which is my favorite of all my books, is that I think Tolkien did such an incredibly powerful job of depicting this alien power. And C.S. Lewis does the same in uh, Paralandra. Even if this agent of evil is not mentioned in the New Testament in so many words, he is nevertheless always and everywhere assumed to be present. The best short account I have ever heard is that of Flannery O'Connell, who says in a letter, our salvation is played out with the devil a devil who is not simply generalized evil, but an evil intelligence determined on its own supremacy. And yet we have forgotten this enemy. After the Enlightenment, any notion of personified evil in the form of the devil became risible, and anyone referring to such a thing would be consigned to the lunatic fringe. It's therefore remarkable that after two centuries in which the concept of Satan was off the table, the two world wars have called forth a rethinking. Many respected writers and thinkers have proposed a reconsideration of a malevolent and purposeful power of evil in the world. I found a paragraph in a book about evil. The name of it is Evil, <laughs> written in published in 2003 by the respected essayist and Time Magazine writer called Lance Morrow. Lance Morrow writes first about right and wrong as familiar ethical categories that everyone understands, even if they may differ about the details of what is right and wrong. But the concept of right and wrong, he says in these essays, does not help us much in comprehending the mystery of evil because, and I'm quoting now, this is really good, so I'm gonna read it very intentionally. This is Lance Morrow writing about evil, different between right and wrong. Evil implies a different universe controlled by extra human forces. Wrong, as in right and wrong, is a human offense that suggests that reparation is possible and deserved. Wrong is not mysterious, but evil suggests a mysterious force that may be in business for itself and may exploit human agency as part of a larger cosmic conflict between good and evil, God and Satan. Now, I don't think Lance Morrow knows this, but he has exactly described the New Testament cosmology. 
the New Testament shows us a different universe, and it claims to be the key to history. Satan is everywhere in the Gospels, in business for himself, and is referred to the, in the epistles, even in James, as a matter of course, as if the devil was part of everyone's mental furniture, as indeed he was. I'm suggesting that contemporary interpretation of the Bible has brought us all up short against the cosmology of the world that the apostles and the evangelists took for granted. Without this cosmology, we have a very incomplete grasp of the full New Testament picture, and therefore for its implications for the Christian life in the world today. I'm going to give you the briefest possible sketch. Mainstream interpreters since the Enlightenment have read the New Testament drama as though there were only two agencies, two actors, God and the human being. In the New Testament, however, there are not two, there are three. God, humanity, and the enemy. Once this gets into your head, the New Testament reads differently. It reads apocalyptically. In a famous quotation from the brothers Karamazov, the devil is struggling with God and the battlefield is the human heart. Three actors, you see, God, Satan, humanity. Once you understand this, the New Testament is going to be different for you. This is the apocalyptic war that pervades the New Testament, especially in the letters of Paul. The struggle takes place on two levels, that of the individual human heart and corporately as the constant warfare between the individual and the power and powers and principalities. In this line of thinking, which is increasingly prevalent among biblical interpreters, not predominant, but becoming more prevalent, the principalities and powers are human institutions that have been co-opted by the enemy and made to serve the demonic purpose instead of the common good. There are numberless examples of this. I'll just give one, Facebook. My granddaughter works for Facebook. Most people in this room probably use Facebook for benign purposes and find it very helpful. Others use it for gathering hate groups, watching for, looking for child pornography, and recruiting terrorists. There is no entity in this present evil age, as Paul calls it in Galatians. There is no entity that is pure and free neither individuals nor corporate groupings. It follows that all human beings are enslaved by the powers, uh, capital P, the power of sin, capital S, the power of death, capital D. We are enslaved by these powers. John says this very clearly in chapter, th ten, eight, chapter eight of John's Gospel. We're enslaved by these powers and we cannot be liberated by any agency from within the force field of this world. We must be liberated by a greater power from a greater field of force. I think it's unarguable that this motif predominates in some part of the New Testament, especially Romans and in John. Where, God is, where Jesus is already the king reigning from the cross. It's also a predominant theme in the patristic period. And Christus Victor was at the center of Martin Luther's message. It's a puzzle to me, therefore, that Christus Victor faded out of the picture in the 19th century in the Protestant orthodoxy, so-called, when penal substitutionary atonement became the be-all, end-all and in some Anglican evangelical circles, 
was the test of soundness. More about that later. Satan drops out of the scenario altogether in this case. And the action is exclusively between God and humanity. As I'll try to show this afternoon, the substitution theme is equally important with Christus Victor, but it should never be allowed to stand by itself over all the other New Testament themes. All things considered, I propose that Christus Victor and substitution can be called the primary themes with others included in them. I have, I believe it's eight different themes that I write about one per chapter in my book. But the overarching ones are, I believe, Christus Victor and Substitution. It is also possible, as I'll try to show this evening, to include the whole panoply of themes within the categories of recapitulation and justification, which I prefer to translate rectification. We'll do that tonight. The Christian gospel cannot be preached or understood in our time unless we grasp the promise of a regime change brought about by the power of God. Human beings are incapable of inaugurating a regime change that will last, as the Old Testament repeatedly tells us. Last Sunday, day before yesterday, there was a little essay in the New York Times by a non-believer who had read the Bible and said that it had no cohesive message whatsoever, which just confirms the fact that the Bible is written for, by faith for faith. That's really important. If you're not, in some sense, willing to give yourselves up to the Bible, you can't understand it. But to get back to my point, as an afterthought, this writer who said that the Bible had no cohesive message, he does have a point in this regard. If it does have a theme, he says, it is this. Human attempts to create lasting regimes will fail utterly. He did miss the message of the New Testament, that only in the cross and resurrection of Christ can we ever see the regime change for all eternity? The holy city that comes down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Behold, the dwelling of God is with humanity, and death shall be no more, for the former things have passed away. Well, when I wrote the book, I didn't realize that regime change was become, would become a more pressing topic than I ever imagined. <laughs> Apparently, there were millions of Americans who wanted a regime change. Many more Americans than most of the pundits and post pollsters realized. This regime change has also been called by those who favor it as disruption. Those millions of Americans who did not want apocalyptic disruption are now suffering, and I do mean suffering, from various degrees of dismay and horror, and I mean that. The optics of your prime minister at the airport rep rep welcoming refugees were certainly, certainly a stunning rebuke to us. Many of us on the Christian left or middle or whatever we are, are reminding each other at every opportunity that Jesus is still Lord and it's tempting simply to withdraw and become apolitical. There's a lot of talk about the Benedict option. There's also some serious conversation about the Bonhoeffer option. <laughs> I'm not gonna go in that direction today, certainly not in Canada, but there are times in human affairs, now seriously, there are times in human affairs when the Lord moves people to overthrow an unjust regime. I am a student of nonviolent movements. I have been for most of my life. And I personally believe that these movements, 
have been the clearest enactments on the geopolitical level of what John Howard Yoder calls the War of the Lamb. The Lamb obviously being Jesus Christ, and the weapons of war being the armor of God described in Ephesians. Increasingly, I believe that the American Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s is still the benchmark. But as the old Christian soldiers of that movement die off, it recedes further back into history. There are a few books, not enough, but a very significant few that tell the story of the profoundly Christian convictions that fueled the civil rights movement and they should be required reading for us all. I guess it's obvious what I'm getting at. Faith in Jesus Christ as victor over sin, evil, and death is not only personally consoling, although it is supremely that, but it also gives us certain marching orders. Not as the world gives, give I unto you, says Jesus in the Gospel of John. One of the most disturbing things about the so-called alt-right movements in the States is their appropriation of biblical language. Christian identity and the Judeo-Christian tradition, quote unquote, that's ironic because the number of anti-Semitic instances in the United States has markedly increased in the past few months, and I just read in this morning's Globe and Mail that there are some in Canada as well. Steve Bannon, Trump's gray eminence, has seized upon the term church militant. Did you know that? Gave a speech at the Vatican. Church militant. That term was never meant to refer to an aggressive policy of imposing Christendom upon the world. There is no hint of a crusader mentality in the New Testament, quite the opposite. The Great Commission was to be carried out by preaching the gospel. Just look at the windows in the Wycliffe Chapel. Look at them again. Look at them carefully. Will Willimon admired them when he was here last year. He wrote me a, an email and said that he thought they were just wonderful. He was inspired by the founders of Wycliffe and others who wanted to remind us that those who went out to preach the gospel sometimes did so at the risk of their own lives. Their own lives, not other people's lives. I'm rather proud of one criticism of my book. Some conservative, quote unquote, reviewers have complained that in my book I put too much emphasis on corporate sin and not enough emphasis on, a re on individual sin. Now that's true. I do that and I did it for a reason. I did it because first I knew I would never get any readership in the mainline churches if I didn't. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to have any reading in the mainline churches anyway. Um, but the second and more important reason is this. I think very sincerely that many of the evangelical churches have focused so exclusively on individual one-on-one -on -one sins for so long that this focus has become a, an excuse for avoiding the great moral, social, economic, and geopolitical scandals of our day. Now the issue, the issue of abortion, which is certainly a social issue, is a notable exception, but since it could be classified both as individual and also as corporate sin, it doesn't quite make my point. Again, the 20th century should have taught us by now about the difference between Romans 13 and Revelation 13. So what I'm trying to put across here is this. All of us, all the time, are in danger of being ensnared by the principalities and powers. In fact, we are ensnared by them every day. Every time I go to the bank, the city bank, one of their mammoth banks in America, I know that I'm participating in some atrocious practices. Anybody or anything less than Jesus Christ 
as Lord of the universe is not worthy of our primary allegiance, unless it's the Blue Jays. I do love baseball. <laughs> Patriotism. You don't have this problem so much in Canada, but you will. You're going to get awfully proud of yourselves, smug, looking down at us. <laughs> I don't blame you. I would, too. But patriotism has always been one of the most insidious of all rivals to the kingdom of God. And as you know, nationalist groups are on the rise in Germany now for the first time since Germany's defeat. Widely admired throughout the world for 60 years for facing up to its crimes, Germany is now for the first time since the war facing serious threats to its pan-European identity. It can happen anywhere. The famously liberal, progressive Dutch are facing the same challenges from their own versions of the alt-right. It can even happen in Canada. Idolatry is one of the most serious of all offenses against God throughout the Bible. Anything that sets itself up as a primary object of worship is an idol. Christians need to be on the alert for this all the time. I've been attending church, blah, 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 <laughs> all the time, and it's been very disappointing to me in recent months not to hear anything specific in the sermons about the dangers of nationalism, greed, prejudice, animosity, gun violence, greed in the marketplace, breakdown of civil liberties, violation of human rights, degradation of the environment. You can see that I'm not going to a lot of liberal churches. When we say Jesus is Lord, we are saying that nothing else is short, nothing else short of him, nothing else short of him is Lord. I've never heard a preacher refer to the earliest Christian confession and how it directly contradicted the prescribed salutation of the emperor. You were supposed to salute the emperor by saying, Kurios Caesar, Caesar is Lord. But as all of you know, the earliest Christian confession was Jesus is Lord. Kurios Jesus, a direct contradiction of the prevailing powers. That's really important. I don't hear much of that except from our, well, the Mennonites have some of that, and the Bruderhof, which I respect a great deal, a great deal, they, they, they're, this, this tradition of not, of, of wanting to resist the lordship of the powers. Caesar is not lord. Jesus is Lord. There you have a political statement, if ever there was one. Now, I do realize that it's quite edgy of me to stand here and preach like this, talk like this to Canadian pastors, because your issues are not the same as ours. But just speaking for myself, for what it's worth, I have always, ever since I was a beginner, I have always preached political sermons from time to time. Now, I've always been in fairly liberal congregations, so it wasn't difficult to do that, really. When I say liberal in this sense, I mean politically liberal, not theologically liberal. And when I say political in referring to preaching, when I say that I've always preached political sermons, I do not mean that I have endorsed candidates or specific parties. What I mean is raising questions about issues and their relationship to the Lordship of Christ. I have friends who are really struggling with what to do, especially in the Washington, D.C. area where their congregations 
tend to be more politically conservative. Kenneth Tanner knows about this. These pastors might lose quite a few of their most prominent members. What's the answer to that? I can't really say. I can only suggest that if we don't practice in our preaching, referring to political issues from time to time in relatively calm times, then we will not have built up any capital with our people when the situation gets worse. Now in the next segment, we're going to talk about the relationship of the cross of Christ to the individual heart. I've got too much material here. I'm trying to decide what to cut. Eesh. Mercy. Oh, wait, that's not as bad as I thought. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure out how much I have left so I'll know how much to. Ugh. For now, I'm trying to put across the vital point that the New Testament depicts two realms locked in combat. The realm of Satan and the powers and the realm of the three-personed God. The exorcisms that Christ performs are like early skirmishes in the confrontation that will come to its climax in the passion of Christ beginning in Gethsemane. I urge you to read in preparation for preaching on Maundy Thursday, if you observe Holy Thursday. I urge you to read the passages on Gethsemane in Raymond Brown's authoritative two-volume, The Death of the Messiah. In these pages, he shows us how the agony in the garden is the opening of the final campaign against the enemy called Satan. This scene, he concludes, logically follows from Jesus' view that the inbreaking of God's kingdom involved a massive struggle with diabolical opposition. In my lifetime, in the Episcopal Church, in the States at least, there's been a big change in the Maundy Thursday service. Within the last 40 years or so, compared to the previous 40 years or so of my lifetime, the service has come to be dominated by the foot washing and a sermon on the foot washing. I urge you this Maundy Thursday to consider a sermon on the agony in the garden and what it signifies. Raymond Brown writes, the entire Gethsemane scene is suffused with the atmosphere of the final trial. I don't have time now to fully develop the theme of the courtroom, which plays such a large part in the Old Testament prophets, especially Isaiah. But the courtroom comes into play in a major way in the Passion narrative. In Gethsemane, Jesus is preparing to undergo the last judgment on our behalf and in our place. It's the opening scene, Gethsemane, of the final apocalyptic conflict with the enemy. I personally have nothing good to say about Mel Gibson's movie about the crucifixion except for one thing. The Gethsemane scene occurs at the very beginning of the movie, The Passion of the Christ. When Jesus rises to his feet after he struggles in prayer, he strides away with great vigor, and as he goes, he grinds a snake under his foot. It's breathtaking. The reference, of course, is to Genesis 3.14, Christologically interpreted. It's the opening scene 
of the eschatological reversal of the fall in the Garden of Eden. The scene in Gethsemane is traditionally called the agony in the garden. The Greek word agon, combat, struggle, contest, is related to the agony, the agonia, used by Luke, that word, to describe Jesus' suffering in the garden. This is of unexpected significance. Jesus is readying himself for the final, final apocalyptic struggle. He is an agonistikos, a combatant. The Greek agonizasthai means to contend, to struggle. The Gethsemane story shows how Jesus, facing the eschatological hour, struggled with his dread of failing, facing the enemy. Ordinarily, great men and women who have been put to death have conducted themselves with serenity, even nobility. The fact that the New Testament puts such emphasis on Jesus' agonia shows that it was perceived as central to the story. The epistle to the Hebrews and all four of the evangelists portray this scene, although John, as usual, does it in his own way. What we see on the night after the Last Supper is the opening scene of the final ap apocalyptic drama of the turning of the ages. As I have summed up in my book, and this will be one of my rare quotations from myself, in the context of the Christus Victor theme, Raymond Brown's interpretation can be embraced without reservation. As we move on, however, a synthesis will be proposed. Jesus is preparing not only to enter the lists as the utterly undefended commander of the Lord's hosts, but also as the one who will stand alone on the front line in our place, absorbing the full onslaught of sin, death, and the devil. Now I've got about three minutes more. When this theme is preached, it must be preached with power. There's a tendency to put a lot of emphasis on Jesus as a victim on the cross, identifying himself with human victims. Now that's not wrong. He is indeed there with solid, in solidarity with victims of every kind, and it has comforted many to know that our Lord went that way before him. But all four Gospels go out of, that way, out of their way to show that Jesus is in control of his destiny. If he is a powerless victim, it is because the triune God has chosen to show his power in precisely this way, the warfare of the sacrificial lamb. It is remarkable that this Christus Victor motif, which was central in the patristic period, should have fallen out of the picture. It has robbed us of the third actor in the New Testament drama. In some circles, the enemy has been missing from the preached narrative for a long time. Martin Luther, however, had a clear sense of this demonic dimension. And I'm going to conclude by reading you a few lines from his great hymn, which you all know, Ein Festeburg. I'm told that it is much better in the original German. It is pure Christus Victor. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he, amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. And still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe, the prince of darkness grim. We tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. <laughs> 
one little word shall fell him. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. The Lord of hosts, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. <laughs>